So I wanted to introduce kind of our panel today. Um, you already met Craig Vandell, our social worker, and Dr. Deanna Mitchell, who is our PI here at Helen Plus, and Dr. Schuller, and Lisa Raniola from Molina's White Light. And Lisa is also on our parent board, and she is just, I think, like one of our best organizational people and kind of focusing us in our meetings and saying, you know, sending us a list of, these are what we, things we need to talk about. So we really appreciate Lisa too. So we wanted to talk about what happens at relapse because I think for those of us that have been there, the relapse word is worse than the cancer word than hearing it the first time because there's such a different, you know, there's such a loss of hope at that point because you know, everything we, we know all we went through before and now that all didn't work. And I think for those of us that when you're in a place where you have not relapsed yet, that's probably the thing that takes up a good portion of your daily thought process is what if this happens and what am I going to do? So that's where we wanted to start today with defining what a relapse is and what it means. I think relapse today means something very different than even relapse five years ago. I think, um, you know, so if we read in the literature, you know, relapse means there's you no know, survival or relapse rates at five years is 10% survival. But I think, you know, there's been an incredible amount of research and changes that are happening and we all know children that are surviving with relapse. So I don't think it's quite the same as it was a few years ago. And what would happen a few years ago is what's published today. What's happening today is not yet published. And so um, it, it's a very serious position that a patient is in when they're at relapse. And I think gathering all the information immediately is important. Some, um, whether you know talking obviously to your oncologist at your home institution and working with your oncologist at your home institution to understand what all the options are. There are so many options now available for children with, with relapse um, at many different centers through many different programs and trying to understand all those and understanding which ones should I do first, second, third, putting together a treatment plan um, with the goal of clear. That's what we're hoping for in, in relapse. You know, I, one of the things that we've learned as well in, in some of our studies is biopsying patients, you know, at relapse. Should I biopsy? Historically, the answer has been no, it's relapse neuroblastoma, we just go on. We know now that we're profiling a lot of patients' tumors and genomics in, in one of our clinical trials where we, you know, biopsy 12 patients, two were ganglioneroma, one was a different tumor, a relapse in a radiation spot that turned out to be an osteosarcoma. It's important to understand just as it is a diagnosis, it's important to understand a biopsy and understand what's going on with the tumor at, at relapse as well. I think that that paradigm is starting to change at our center and at many other centers across the U.S. that are seeing relapse neuroblastoma patients. That that biopsy and truly understanding what happened um, is important. Relapse also makes a big difference depending on the risk of your child. So a child who is under 18 months at diagnosis. Uh, even with stage four disease, if that child relapses, uh, outcome data is significantly better um, than if your child was over. So the age uh, issue remains important. Um, and uh, I agree that, uh, you know, knowing what the tissue is, not always, sometimes it's clear from the bone marrow or the MIBG, uh, you know, it's clear that this is, you know, relapsed metastatic neuroblastoma. So a biopsy is not always necessary, uh, but a biopsy has uh, really changed our complete approach in a few patients, you know, with relapse. So knowing what that is at the time of something being present on a scan is important. Also, um, you know, sometimes uh, it may be a second malignancy. Uh, we've seen sarcomas, but certainly in the bone marrow, we've seen myelodysplastic syndrome. And so knowing what we're dealing with helps us identify, well, what does this mean for this child? Help us make the best decisions is what should happen next. I think parents always want to know, you know what are my child's survival rates now? And so I think as you mentioned though, that's it, it's very different and we're learning more all the time. So it's really hard to pin that down, even though that's what they wanna know. I mean, It's what parents wanna know, or it seems like it's what parents wanna know even up front, uh, but no one child can be a statistic. So all of our statistics are based on historical <coughs> data. And historically, 
you know, we've done poorly with relapse, high risk neuroblastoma. Um, but I think um, I agree with Dr. Schuller that um, we have new um, drug options as well as new molecular data um, that, you know, you'd have to be honest and say, I don't really know what the next five years will bring. Uh, I mean, parents have to deserve the information that this is high risk and, you know, that uh, we may lose this battle. Um, but I think beyond that, you know, even if you come into on pediatric oncology with standard risk leukemia and we tell you, okay, there's an 85% chance your child will grow up, you know, doing this work, we know, I can't tell you that's your child. I can't tell you for your child uh, in a positive or negative way. Um, so you make the best decisions looking at quality and um, options available and being a family. So you make the best decisions kind of with that whole picture. In the past, though, we lost neuroblastoma. But many centers would say, though, because of the poor survival, that at that time, hospice is also an option. Um, I think that we've learned a lot, and I think that there are a lot of good options that can give good quality of life, but that it is worth treating relapse neuroblastoma, and that there are children who are living much longer than we would have expected them to. But that's a very personal decision that needs to you know, be made. I think that's one of the changes, though, that seems to be happening. Well, and sometimes it seems like, in my experience, hospice feels like a bad word to families. They equate hospice to giving up. And I really think there is a middle-of-the-road approach to this, that we should be thinking palliation really from day one. We should be looking at, um, you have a child with stage four neuroblastoma, we should be looking at quality time as a family and with that child. Um, and I think, if a child has relapsed neuroblastoma, we really should be asking quality questions. How can we treat this child in the most effective way and also um, <coughs> make sure that we're thinking about quality? And, and I think Dr. Scholler's studies and NMTRC studies, you know, try hard to look at that. But I think it doesn't have to be a giving up philosophy. I think you can try to encompass palliation and still treat. I thought Patty did a good job about bringing that up yesterday in your speech when you were talking yesterday about your son, um, about bringing that up of quality of care and quality of life too. That has to be encompassed in the whole process. <coughs> yeah, I think palliative care, we are trying, our, our nurse practitioner, Shannon McKeegan, is bringing a program into our clinic now where every patient will have a palliative, you know, Children who receive palliative care, sort of symptoms and quality of life live longer. It's on phase one and early phase studies live longer. If we could do both together, we could improve the quality of life and the length of life. And so we're trying to incorporate, because we need to make sure that children have good nutrition because then they're gonna be stronger and able to tolerate more therapy. Their physical therapy needs are really important because it, it allows them to also receive more therapy um, and be able to go to school and be happy. Um, their pain needs, if their pain needs are, are under control, they can run around more, they can get stronger, we can continue to get more. So those are all things that need to be part of relapsed care. Um, but, and we don't have a crystal ball to say, okay, what direction is this gonna go? But I think the more that we can work together as a team with parents and children uh, to find the best pathway for each family, and that may be different for everything. So I think every, it sounds like everybody agrees that you know quality of life is really important too. Lisa, do you have any like in your? Well, when Melina relapsed, that was we always Melina was eight years old when she was diagnosed, so she was the old lady on the block. We knew the statistics right off the bat were horrible for her, even though she had minimal disease. She was stage two B. Um, she was. We always did our plans, looked at all of our options, but in the back of our mind, it was always quality of life. You know, how much quality of life can we give her but still fight? We never gave up hope of finding, you know, the one thing that would work for her. We were trying that, you know, to the end. But it was also, how much is she going to suffer? Is she going to enjoy anything in life? 
you know, can she do anything that she really likes to do? Because there's so much she couldn't do, you know. And so that was always a huge factor in my husband and mine's decision on what trial we would do. She got a little say in there too. She always had to throw that in there, but it was always quality of life for us. You know, we wanted to, we want. Sometimes you have to. You feel like, well, maybe I got to do that really heavy, hard, toxic thing. But you know, the, the quality if she, if she you get her to live a little bit longer, but she can't even sit up in bed. You know, what's the point of that for her? That's not helping her. That might be comforting me in a way that I still have her, but that's all it's doing. So quality of life throughout our whole relapse life was always big part of our decision of what we did and where we went. And we always tried to take the less toxic route with Melina, which, you know, she lived for six years with minimal disease till like the last year of her life. So, you know, I guess in a way that was a positive effect 